Chapter 5 is on Rashi, and the Rashi are the signs in Vedic astrology. What Rashi literally means is it means a heap, a pile, or a grouping. It could also be a quantity of something. So we could look at it as a quantity of the sky, a, a slice of the sky. But there's a, a much deeper understanding when we really meditate on Rashi that I hope I'll be able to transmit that understanding of how a Rashi truly is a heap of a quantity of degrees. The first thing that we need to understand though is where are the Rashi coming from and why do we only have 12? Why not 13? As we see a lot of new age astrologers are using 13 signs. They've redivided the sky and if we look at astronomers they're like what are you talking about 30 degrees? This sign is only 15. This sign is actually 40. There are just chopping up the sky and because they're looking at the stars and they're starting from one point of the star and ending at the other point of the star. That's how they're understanding the signs. They're going from a very spatial perspective. Now, what we have to understand is that the signs are the Kala Rupa of Vishnu. Kala is time, Rupa is form. So the signs are the form of the divine as time. Parashara very clearly tells us this, as well as the other rishis. So the signs are the embodiment of time. They're not spatial in and of themselves. They are not created based upon the space of the stars. They are created based on an allotment of time relative to the stars falling in that allotment of time. Throughout a year, throughout a cycle of the earth moving around the sun, there are 12.3 lunar months. 12.3. So I know some people these days are talking about the 13 moons, but there aren't 13 moons in a year. There's 12.3. 12.3. That means after every three years, we have an extra month. And so different, when you study calendars, different cultures have done different things to calculate that extra month. Some of them add an extra few days at the end of every year. The way in Vedic astrology that they've approached it is every three years, they have an extra month lunar month. And that extra lunar month, called an intercalary month, makes the lunar months and the solar months stay in alignment. What's very important with a calendar is that alignment between the sun and the moon. Because most traditional calendars, especially the Vedic, were using both the moon and the sun to calculate time. Now, when we understand that there's 12.3 lunar um, cycles in a year, we round that. If we wanted to round it, we round down. We don't round up because it's 0.3. So it rounds down till 12. So that 12 becomes 12 solar months or the 12 signs of the zodiac. And so that 12 is projected out into space. Those 12 cycles are projected. So it's time projected onto space, not space projected onto time. Very key to understand. So in Western astrology, there can be a 13th sign because from the Western perspective, the signs are symbolic. It's a symbolic zodiac. And the word sign literally means symbol. So it's a symbolic zodiac. So you could have 13, you could have 14 signs if you want to. But in the Vedic zodiac, it's not a symbolic zodiac. It's time personified. It's the lunar months projected and matched with the solar months. Therefore, there can only be 12. The next thing that needs to be understood is the Ayanamsha. 
And the Ayan Amsha is described um, from page 115 to 117. And understanding the Ayan Amsha, we understand the difference between the tropical zodiac and the sidereal zodiac. And if you look at the diagram on page 117, the inner zodiac, the small inner zodiac, is the tropical zodiac. And the outer zodiac is the sidereal zodiac. The inner one is what is called the symbolic zodiac. The outer one is what is the actual stellar positions. What the actual signs that have been projected, where they are actually placed. This section does a very good job of, of explaining how that all works. We're going to move to getting deeper into understanding the Rashi themselves. And on page 119, we have our first breakdown of the signs. So everything starts from one. One divides into two, masculine and feminine, yin-yang, whichever way you want to describe it. From that two, it breaks down to three. From three, it breaks down to four. We're going to break down the signs in a similar way to begin with. The first breakdown is that we have 12 signs. And on page 119, we have the South Indian, uh, what's called the Brihaspati Chakra. In the Brihaspati Chakra, the signs are fixed. So we see, um, and just for beginners, you can actually take Aries and write the number one. Taurus, write the number two. Gemini, write the number three. Cancer, four. Leo, five. Virgo, six. Libra, seven. Scorpio, eight. Sagittarius, nine. Capricorn, ten. Aquarius, eleven. And Pisces, twelve. These numbers correlate to the positions of these signs, which are always in the same place in this Brihaspati Chakra. Now, when we, and this is all in the uh, graph at the bottom of the page, but when we look at Cancer and Leo, Cancer is 4, Leo is 5. Cancer is ruled by the moon, Leo is ruled by the sun. This is our first male-female reality. The first break from that one becoming two. The mind and the soul. So cancer represents the feminine, and it's an even sign. Four is even. So in general, the even signs show us the feminine energy. Leo, the sun, the solar energy, is an odd sign, five. And that odd signs show us the masculine energy, or the young energy. When we look on either side of the Brihaspati Chakra, we see that to the one side of Cancer, we have three, which is Gemini. To the other side of Leo, we have Virgo, which is six. So we have an odd number on one side and an even number on the other side. When you look at the chart, both of those signs, Gemini is ruled by Mercury and Virgo is ruled by Mercury. So Mercury falls on both sides of the sun and the moon. One of those signs is odd, one is even. Gemini, being the odd sign, is expressing that young energy of Mercury, that masculine outgoing energy. So Gemini relates to, Mercury is a planet of communication, um, of gathering, of people. The... Uh, Gemini is that outward motion that shows the outward business aspect of Mercury. The aspect of parties, of gatherings of people, of talking, of sharing, of uh, making newspapers and things of that nature. The outward direction of Mercury. Where when we look at Virgo, it's even. So it's feminine. It's the yin. It shows the inward energy of Mercury. So what, do, what happens when we take that same energy and we make it yin? It becomes the inner refinement. It becomes the perfectionism. It com becomes the uh, path of uh, proper communication. Things along that line. 
So when we look to the signs next to each of them in the Brahaspati Chakra, we can see that we have two, which is Taurus, and seven, which is Libra. Both of those are ruled by Venus. One is the even, one is the odd. So the even Taurus energy is where Venus is expressing itself through the yin way, inward. It's looking for comforts in life. It's looking for gentleness. It's looking for food, nurturance. Where in Libra, that's the outward energy. It's going out. The Libra shows the marketplace where people are making artwork and performing and sharing outward energy versus the inward energy of Taurus. When we look at next, we see one and eight in the Brahaspati Chakra. One is Aries, eight is Scorpio. Now these numbers in Vedic astrology are very important to associate the number with the sign because when it comes to mathematical calculations and various things, when you just um, can understand those numbers and when the numbers and the signs mean the same thing, it'll make your Jyotishian calculations a lot faster. So Aries is the outward direction of Mars. It's the warrior fighting, going out, conquering, where Scorpio is the feminine energy of Mars. It's the inner warrior. It's the exploration of the occult. It's that same Mars energy turned inwards, yin. Then we have Pisces and Sagittarius, 12 and 9. So 9 is the odd number. It's the masculine energy of Jupiter. Jupiter is the planet of Dharma, righteousness. So when it becomes masculine, it becomes a lawyer and a judge stamping down, making laws, enforcing laws, making properness, uh, having wars to correct things. This is Sagittarius. It's that uh, masculine implementation of law, where with Pisces, it's an even sign. So it's the yin side of Jupiter. It's that internal side. What is true Dharma? True Dharma is realizing that we're all one. So that Pisces energy is that unity consciousness that Jupiter gives us. That cosmic understanding. It's the reality that it's all one ocean and we're all sharing it. And so it's the Dharma leaves the physical plane and goes a little bit more to the spiritual yin side where we become in tune with Dharma from the inner sense. In this way, this is the first breakdown of the zodiac into two. Odd and even, masculine and feminine. On page 120 and 121, we have two graphs that give us a little bit more detailed nature of the signs and their representation. And this is to um, give an idea of how we are using the uh, signs and how they are manifesting reality. So on page 120, it gives the constitution, the vata pitta kapha of each sign and the corresponding shape of the body given according to uh, Parashara. Parashara tells us that Aries has a large body. Taurus is tall and long. Gemini is well proportioned and has a vata type body. So this gives us a general idea of the shape that the sign is giving. Now the house represents the place or area of life and the sign tells us what that place or area of life is like. So the way that works is the first house shows what our body looks like. Therefore, which sign is placed in that house shows what is the condition of that body. Therefore, if a person has a Gemini ascendant, the body is generally well proportioned. Now, a planet in that house will take predominance and will change the effect. But the sign has the basic energy that's 
describing that area of life. If a planet is there, it overpowers that sign, but is still um, giving an effect relative to that sign. Um, so this is just an example of how the signs are showing us the area of life, defining that area of life. Yeah. On page 121, we have a list of the signs and the body areas that they correlate to. Aries relates to the head, Taurus the face, Gemini the arms, Cancer goes to the chest region. So Gemini is basically the shoulder all the way down the arms. Leo rules the stomach area, primarily what we call the solar plexus. Leo is ruled by the sun. It's the solar area. Libra rules the lower abdomen or the pelvic area, the area of the body where the reproductive organs are stored and kept. Um, I skipped Virgo. Virgo is that lower stomach area, which is containing all the intestines. Virgo is very much associated with digestion. Virgo is the sign related to health. Very important for Ayurveda because it's the intestines. It's the digestion. The digestion is no good. The health is no good. The digestion is good. Everything gets healthy. Right? Therefore, Virgo being that intestinal area is the sign connected to health overall. Libra is the uh, lower abdomen. Scorpio is the anus um, and it's the external genitalia relative to the seventh house is the general uh, reproductive system. The eighth house it's the external relative to the parts that get sweaty and dirty. It's the dirty aspect. Mm -hmm. Excretion. Excretion and yeah. What's the Ayurvedic word? Shmegma. Okay. Sure. <laughs> huh? That's huh? So it's it's that that's Scorpio. Sagittarius is the thighs, Capricorn the knees, Aquarius the calves, and Pisces the feet. Now, Saravali teaches us, and this is, and some people, their practice, their Ayurvedic Jyotish is only at this level, but this is the most basic, basic level. Wherever Saturn is placed, Saturn is a planet that shows suffering and Vata. So whatever sign Saturn is placed in, there's Vata disturbance in that area. Vata disturbance can show deformity, problems working, disturbance of, of the proper functioning or formation of. So therefore, uh, Saturn in Gemini is going to show issues with the arms. Saturn in Virgo is going to show issues with digestion and that part of the body. This is very basic Ayur Jyotish. There's much more complex ways to get very specific with disease. A general understanding. A malefic planet goes to that area and it's going to cause problems. A benefic planet like Jupiter goes to one of these areas and it's going to protect that area. It's going to make it more beautiful, stronger, healthier. So those two sections are giving us a general idea of the working of the signs. How the signs are we're utilizing them with the energies that we've understood with the masculine and feminine. Now, that first, that masculine and feminine breakdown was into the two. The next breakdown is into the three. And if you look at the uh, chart on page 123, what first stands out is two squares, but there's actually three squares there. And if we look, there, the first square is from Aries, it goes to Cancer, then to Libra, then to Capricorn, and back to Aries. That's square number one. That is the Chara square. And that Chara, Chara means it's movable or Rajas. It means it has lots of energy. Those signs are Rajas signs. Our next square goes from Taurus to Leo to Scorpio to Aquarius and back to Taurus. 
Those are our stira signs, or what is called fixed signs. And the fixed signs have tamas energy. They're heavy, steady, very not moving. Our third square is actually the square of the Brihaspati Chakra, which starts with Gemini. It goes straight down to Virgo, goes directly across to Sagittarius, and directly up to Pisces, and then back over to Gemini. So that's our third square. So we have three squares. And those signs, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces, those corners, are what we call Dwishwa Bhava, or dual signs. They're the sattvic signs. They have a balance of tamas and rajas. Therefore, they are sattva. These are the three gunas. And as we have three gunas, we have three squares there. Now, squares have how many corners? Four. So the three divides the zodiac into four. Three times four is twelve. This is important to understand. So the gunas make a square, or what we call kendras. So our first understanding was that Aries is the masculine energy of Mars. Now we deepen that, and we understand that it's a rajas sign, and it's giving us the rajasic masculine energy of Mars. Aries is becoming more clear. And as I said before, the more we understand the planets, the more we understand everything else. So the more you meditate it on Mars, as we talked about in the previous classes, the more that Aries, the masculine side in its rajasic nature is going to mean. When we look at Taurus, Taurus is the even Venus sign, but it's also Tamas. So it gives us the general uh, objective, what that sign is wanting to get, how that sign is approaching reality. Taurus is approaching through a Tamasic bent. It's fixed. It doesn't like to move. Bring the comforts to me. Let them all be at my house. So we begin to understand that way through the gunas. And by meditating on each of these signs, and I've written in on page 123 to 124, going into each of the signs, taking them through the gunas. So this is our next deepening of the signs. From three we go to four. So we went to, we had one, we had the, the whole sky around us. We, through time, divided it into 12, and then we took that 12 and we grouped them into twos, masculine and feminine. Now we grouped them into gunas, and those gunas gave us so much more depth into understanding those signs. Now we take it into four, and those are the four elements, not including the space element. Space element is everywhere, in everything. So no one sign can have more space than another. Space is permeating everything. Space is like God, everywhere. If we look at the chart on page 124, we see that, and it's a little hard to see, so if you have a, a few different colored pens, you can use those pens to trace the different triangles. And by tracing those triangles, it'll make it stand out a little bit more. That we have from Aries, it's fire. And from there we go to Leo, which is again fire. And from there we go to Sagittarius, which is fire. And from there back to Leo. So that's a triangle. That triangle of fire is called a trine. Or in Sanskrit, a trikona. Triangle trikona. So the division of the four elements gives us a shape that has three corners, where the division of the zodiac into three gave us a shape with four corners. 
The division of the zodiac into four gave us a shape with three corners. It was a slight reversal there. But three times four is twelve. Now, as we begin to look and we understand that Aries, it's the masculine side of Mars. It is the rajasic side of Mars. And it's also the fiery side of Mars. We, get a, we begin to really get a depth of understanding of Aries from a fundamental root foundation. Understanding a guna, understanding an element, understanding the planet, we put that all together and we begin to, from a fundamental level, understand the energy of Aries. After that, everything we read in the classic texts just helps us clarify our understanding. Everything else we read is not making us understand. It's clarifying our understanding. Because first we have a foundation, and then we just add details to it. We're not letting all the details define the sign. We're letting the fundamental factors define it, the fundamental energies, and then we add the details in. If we compare Aries to Scorpio, Scorpio is the feminine side of Mars, and it's a fixed sign. So it's Tamas. So it's not moving. And it's water. So it's non-moving water. What happens to non-moving water? Becomes stagnant. When we looked on the body, what type of, what area of the body did I say this Scorpio ruled? Those sweaty areas in the private areas. It's that stagnant, that, where, where things become stagnant. In this way, we understand the signs. Now, just as Scorpio is the Tamas side of water, we follow that trine to Pisces, that triangle up to Pisces. And Pisces is water too. But Pisces was a Dwishva Bhava sign, which is a Sattvic sign. We follow that trine over to Cancer. And Cancer is a water sign, but that was a Chara sign, which is a Rajas sign. So in this trine of the three elements, each element relates to one of the gunas. Very important to understand the root foundation of where the signs and the energies are manifesting through. So with fire in Aries, we have rajasic fire. With the fire in Leo, we have tamasic fire. With the fire in Sagittarius, we have sattvic fire. So we have the elements coming through the three gunas, or the three gunas coming through the elements. Meditating on this, understanding what those energies are. How does fire manifest when it is tamasic? How does fire manifest when it is sattvic? How does fire manifest when it is rajasic? That's the root understanding that we have to grasp. And when we fully grasp that, we read the ancient texts and they make sense. So, concluding this little part here, as we saw with the gunas, it's broken down into three. Three giving us a square. That square is called kendra. And we have a little graph on the bottom of page 124. So those kendras, the gunas are affecting the mind. This is a straight quote from Ayurveda. Gunas affect the mind. Therefore, those quadrants are very important for the moon. And when we go deeper, we always utilize the quadrants from the moon because the quadrants from the moon show the gunas. And when something is quadrant or kendra from itself, it's in the same guna, meaning it's thinking and processing the same way. When we look at trines or trichona, we're looking at the elements, meaning that the 
planet, uh, planets and trines are in the same element. They're acting the same way. They're manifesting and they have the same elemental resources. This resources relate to the sun. And when we look and when we utilize techniques relative to the sun, we are always utilizing the trine. So that's our fundamental understanding. Going a little deeper into the uh, fire, earth, air, and water of the signs. Each of the uh, these four elements relate to the four yugas. The yugas are generally considered these huge time cycles that we exist within. At the same time, those huge time cycles are also broken down into smaller time cycles. At the same time, in our life, we also go through different yugas. We have phases in our life where we're in Kali Yuga, where we totally are putting uh, poisons in our body and negative substances and we're lacking enough consciousness. And we have other times where we're living in Satya Yuga, very pure consciousness. We have other times where we're living in Tretya Yuga and having a wonderful relationship and it's all about love in our life. So we go through in our own life through different phases of the yugas. This and how we calculate what yuga we go in is actually going to be in volume two. But right now we're just going to understand in the chart what these yugas represent relative to the signs. And on page 125 we can see that Satya Yuga is related to fire. Tretya Yuga is related to earth. Dwapara Yuga is air. And Kali Yuga is water. Now, when we understand how the elements interact, as we meditated upon the elements, the uh, and to really understand very easily, make a square. And the top left corner is the air element. The top right corner is the fire element. The bottom left corner is the water element and the bottom right corner is the earth element. Going across, air and fire are friendly. Water and earth are friendly. That's across. Going down, air and water are neutral. Fire and earth are neutral. Going across, f water and fire are enemies. Air and earth are enemies. So in Satya Yuga, which is connected to fire, fire doesn't get along with water. So in Satya Yuga, Dharma is predominant. But what is water? Water is moksha. So in Satya Yuga, moksha becomes very difficult. From the mythological perspective, in Satya Yuga, people live thousands of years. No one's worried about moksha because no one's dying anytime soon. They got plenty of time. They'll worry about that in a few thousand years. <laughs> In Tretya Yuga, where the earth element becomes strong, Artha becomes very prosperous. But the earth element is enemies with the air element. And the air element represents Kama, pleasure, relationship. So in Tretya Yuga, monetary things are there, but relationship is lacking. And you can notice when you look in people's lives, you'll see sometimes dharma's there, moksha's missing. Sometimes money's there, but they can't get a good relationship. We'll see these elements often do not work well together. Like they say, you can't have the cake and the icing too. What's the... And eat it too. And eat it too. So it's... Um, when we have one thing, it's inimical to something else. 
as we take these elements into our life. When we look at Dwapara Yuga, it's the air element. And air is inimical to earth. So we get the pleasure, but then where goes the money? In Kali Yuga, because it's connected to the water element, moksha becomes very easy to achieve. You got a hundred years, life is suffering, you're just, <laughs> nothing's working, you might as well just. Moksha becomes very easy. But at the same time, water is inimical to fire. Dharma's gone. Some people debate whether we're in Kali Yuga or not. In Kali Yuga, when there's no Dharma, what that means is when there is Dharma, crooks go to jail, good people become kings. What happens in Kali Yuga, there's no Dharma. Crooks become kings and good people go to jail. <laughs> like this, we know we're in Kali Yuga. Things aren't following their Dharma. Spiritual people are generally left poor. Because there's no support going. So Dharma is not being followed in Kali Yuga. If we look at the stories of the avatars, Ram is the Treta Yuga avatar. In Treta Yuga, what do we have? We have wealth, and what are we lacking? And what happened to Ram? His wife was stolen from him. And he battled, got her back, got his kingdom. And then even after he got his kingdom, he still couldn't be with Sita. I don't know how many people know the end of the Ramayana, but he didn't get to live happily ever after with Sita. If we look at the story of Krishna, Krishna is the Dwapara Yuga avatar. What do we have in Dwapara Yuga? Kama, pleasure. Do you know how many wives Krishna had? <laughs> He had plenty of wives. But the war in the time of Krishna was based on a kingdom. They couldn't share it. There wasn't enough to share. They were fighting over wealth. So we can see, even in these stories of the avatars, there's so much hidden. So much astrological information coded in these stories.